Welcome to the EPG Patshala course in linguistics of which I am responsible for the morphology and syntax paper. My name is Prabal Dasgupta. I teach at the Indian Statistical Institute, Kolkata. And in this 31st module discussed in this video, we shall cover the contrast between agreement phenomena and classifier phenomena. We begin by announcing that nearly all the languages from which we have been drawing our examples are morphological agreement languages, but that Bangla, one language from which we have been drawing a large number of examples because it is my mother tongue, uses nominal classification devices, especially classifiers, and that classifier languages differ crucially in their organization from agreement languages. In this module, we shall begin by showing you what the dichotomy of agreement and classification is all about, and then looking at phenomena concerning specificity, definiteness, and anti-definiteness. Finally, we shall connect classification to another very closely related phenomenon, which is titularization, that is characteristic of classifier languages. Both in agreement and in classification, we are looking at the semantic features of nouns in terms of which they get broken up into subclasses of nouns. In agreement languages, the relevant features tend to be person, number, and gender. In classification languages, we divide nouns into extremely diverse types, honorific, diminutive, individuated, segmental, stick-shaped, tooth-shaped, fragmentary, complete, collective, and so on and so on. It is very diverse indeed. Let us compare agreement in an agreement language like Hindi, Urdu, teen choti chiriya ur gai, three little birds flew away, where ur gai is the verb agreeing with the subject choti chiriya and reflecting the fact that the subject is third person, feminine, plural. In contrast, when you look at a Bangla example, you will find that akta deal, one wall, duto deal, two walls, tinte deal, three walls, chatte deal, four walls. When you embed them in a sentence and attach a verb, they trigger exactly the same kind of verb agreement. It doesn't matter whether it is one wall or four walls. So it is pointless to watch the verb agreement for the variation. Look more closely at the forms for one wall, two walls, three walls, four walls. The forms are acta deal, du to deal, tin te deal, chatte deal. So the ta classifier, which is attached to the four numerals ak, du, tin, char, changes its shape. With the numeral one, it is acta. With the numeral two, it is du to. With the numerals three and four, it is tin te chat te. This is where you have to pay attention. In the case of Bangla, you have to pay attention to the traffic between the classifier and the host word to which it is attached. In classifier languages, the element can be attached to, to a numeral host, as in these examples we have given or to a demonstrative host or to a noun host. In the examples under set 2, 2, A, B, C, D, E, F, etc., you will see a huge number of different classifiers in Bangla. I will not bore you by imposing a reading out loud of all these examples in this oral exposition, because then you will lose the thread of what we are trying to do. Be assured that this is only the tip of the iceberg. 
a full-time classifier language as opposed to an intermediate classifier language like Bangla, which has only about 10 or 12 classifiers. A full-time language has closer to 25 or 30. So the diversity of classifiers is much bigger than you can imagine. Typically, a classifier is a little noun, a noun which has been partly grammaticalized and pressed into the service of the grammatical system. For example, in Indonesian, in Bahasa Indonesia, as the language is called, if you wish to say three elephants, learning that the word in Indonesian for three is tiga, and the word for elephant borrowed from Sanskrit is gajah, is not sufficient. If you say tiga gajah, that is very bad Indonesian. People will cover their ears in disgust and say, this man has not even begun to learn the simplest language in the world. Indonesian is very easy to learn. But you have to learn to say tiga ekor gajah. Ekor is the Indonesian word for tail. In order to say three elephants, you have to say three tail elephant. The tail is used to catch the elephants and bring them together, to measure how many there are, to point to one elephant rather than the other, etc. Tail is the classifier word for elephants. Of course, tail is also a noun in Indonesian. If you want to talk about the tail, you say ekor. But in addition to being a full-fledged noun, it is also a semi-grammaticalized entity in the Indonesian grammatical system. That is when it functions as a classifier. In a language like Bangla, which is halfway between Hindi, Urdu, a full-fledged agreement language, and Bahasa Indonesia, a full-fledged classifier language. In Bangla, you have a contrast between classifiers, which are integrated into the host word, giving rise to effects like 1, 2, 3, 4, giving sh different shapes of the classifier, ta, ak, ta, du, to, tin, te. In addition to these, you also have non-integrated classifiers in Bangla, where you can see that they are little nouns, separated from the host. They don't have a host. These are only connected to mass nouns, and we call them massifiers, because they really measure words. Thus, for example, if you want to measure the T that some group is having, you say ting pea la cha or cha pea la cha, which means three cup tea, four cup tea. You're measuring how many cups of tea somebody's having. Likewise, when you have a sack full of sugar, ak bosta chini, or cha botol beer, six bottles of beer, or art bati payas for eight bowls of payasam, you are using massifiers. These words for bottle and sack and so on are not integrated with the numeral or any other host word the way ta gets integrated with the numeral in the examples ak ta du to tin te. How do we know that classifiers are integrated beyond the fact that ak du tin are associated with ta to te? Is there any other evidence at all or are we overgeneralizing from one piece of evidence? We need to report here phonological effects that establish beyond doubt the integration of classifiers, not only for ta. Consider the fact that when the classifier ta is attached to the Bangla demonstratives a, which means this, and o, which means that, the result is words like eta and ota. Now you need to contrast eta and ota where the vowel is phonetically short. We say eta rather than eta. With what happens when you take a word like tre, which is from the English tre, it's a loan word in Bangla, and attach the classifier ta to tre in order to say the tre, you say tre ta. You don't say treta, you say tre ta. Treta has a long e that contrasts with the short e of eta. This phonetic length contrast in a language that does not have a phonemic length contrast for vowels is a sign 
that in tray ta there is a word boundary intervening between tray and ta whereas in eta there is no word boundary intervening that goes to show that the classifier ta is integrated with the demonstrative but not integrated with the noun likewise when you take egulo for the collective classifier corresponding to the plural number egulo means these used for inanimates and when you compare egulo these with the word tregulo which means the trees notice again that tregulo has a long a whereas egulo has a short a again indicating that egulo is a word that fully integrates the classifier gulo into the shape of a single word without a word boundary between a and gulo whereas in tregulo gulo is halfway between a fully integrated affix and a fully separated word it is what is called a clitic So there is a sharp contrast between classifiers which show these signs of integration into a word and massifiers which never do so. However, what we have just called a sharp contrast between the relative integration of classifiers and the complete non-integration of massifiers in a language like Bangla, which is a classifier language of sorts. That so-called sharp contrast pales in the presence of the really salient phenomena of integration it is better to call it fusion that you get when you inspect inflectional phenomena inflectional phenomena in agreement languages and in the agreement enclave of an intermediate classifier language like bangla are much more extreme in their phonological effects consider the word uni which is the distal honorific personal pronoun it is he or she pointing towards far away from you and attaching an honorific feature when you take that uni which is a nominative singular and look at its genitive or accusative plural form oder you find that between uni and oder there is not a single phoneme in common there is a portmanteau element fusing the expression of case with that of number and o is an allomorph sharply different from uni the differences are far sharper than anything you find in the phenomena integrating a classifier into its host numeral or its host demonstrative in bangla there are even clearer cases of inflection being integrated in these bizarre ways into the word in other truly inflectional languages bangla is a cakewalk compared to those languages the syntax therefore must draw a boundary between classifiers and massifiers after acknowledging that there is some difference between how much they are integrated So there's a boundary between classifiers and massifiers on the one hand and inflection on the other hand. Inflection is a matter of features on a word. There is no separate piece of language. There is no separate word that expresses inflection. You don't expect to find the expression women accusative case. taking the form of one noun for woman and side by side another full fledged word that says hello i express the fact that my neighbor is feminine and plural that never happens there is never a separate word indicating gender number person that is sharply separated from the neighbor that is the actual noun or pronoun inflection never gets a word to itself In contrast the syntax must treat the classifier or massifier as a syntactically separate element. The main difference between agreement languages and classifier languages however does not lie in the fact that agreement languages fuse the inflection with the word that carries the features. As the term agreement indicates the really sharp contrast lies in the fact that agreement languages use inflection to mark agreement in contrast classifier languages do not give classifiers any role 
in connecting one part of the syntactic structure with another part of the syntactic structure. Classifiers are not an agreement device at all. Inflection is an agreement device. There is variation about which parts of the sentence agree with which parts of the sentence across agreement languages. There are strong agreement languages where there is a lot of agreement between node and node. There are weak agreement languages where only a few nodes in the syntactic tree agree with other nodes. But all agreement languages sharply contrast with classifier languages where there is either no agreement at all as in Indonesian or Chinese or very limited agreement indeed as in Bangla. The best place to see the contrast between these intermediate classifier languages like Bangla and all agreement languages both weak and strong like the weak agreement language English and the strong agreement language Sanskrit is to look at the structure of the noun phrase. In the noun phrase a noun agrees with its dependence, at least one type of dependent, in all agreement languages. In a classifier language, the noun does not agree with any dependent in the noun phrase. In the e-text, we give you elaborate exemplification of this statement. Briefly, in Esperanto, in the noun phrase, the noun agrees with adjectives and demonstratives. In Hindi, which is exactly like Esperanto, the noun agrees with adjectives and demonstratives. To put it backwards, the demonstratives and adjectives agree with the noun. What I really mean is that the two sides agree. In Bangla, neither the adjective nor the demonstrative agrees with the noun. That puts Bangla firmly in the class of classifier languages. Even though Bangla is an intermediate classifier language, it does not go all the way like Bahasa Indonesia. Nonetheless, it is in the noun phrase that you can see that Bangla is in its heart of hearts, not an agreement language, even though it has some half-hearted agreement between subject and verb. Now it is time to inform you that even though classifiers themselves do not bring about agreement between one part of the syntactic tree and another, even though classifiers are not agreement devices, you never find a classifier appearing twice in two places to say I'm marking agreement between place A and place B by appearing in the two places. Nonetheless, the feature content of classifiers in an intermediate language like Bangla plays a role shaping what happens in the limited agreement that such a language exhibits. Thus in Bangla, if you compare 5A and 5B, you will find that when you're talking about a member of the working class, a worker, this language embedded as it is in class society where mainstream discourse disparages the working class, it is possible to refer to a worker either with a fully human classifier respecting the humanity of the worker or to use a general classifier that basically leaves it open whether you think of the worker as a dignified human being fully equal to all other citizens or whether somebody of the upper class is looking down on a worker and treating a worker as expendable as not fully human. When that general classifier ta is used to say acta shromik a worker considered without full honor given to the worker's humanity. In the presence of the classifier ta, the verb takes non-honorific agreement. You say acta shromik ashbe, a worker will come with non-honorific morphology on the verb. You cannot say acta shromik ashbin. Of course, if you do speak in a way that respects fully the humanity of the worker and accords not just full humanity but equality. You will choose another classifier, the human classifier John, then you will say act John Shromik. If you do that depending on your politics, 
whether you wish to give full honor to the worker, you will choose either the honorific verb ashbin with the na at the end, or the non-honorific verb ashbe. So you will say either agjon shromik ashbin with honorific a worker will come, or agjon shromik ashbe without the honorific ending. You have a choice and it depends on your politics. In the case of choosing the default classifier ta, which is the general classifier with the word for worker, the grammar does not allow you to use the honorific ending on the verb. That is where the features of classifiers play a role affecting the agreement system in a mixed language like Pangla, where there is some agreement and some classification. English is an intermediate agreement language just as Bangla is an intermediate classifier language. When we say English is a weak agreement language, we mean not only that the English agreement system doesn't go all the way, that their adjectives don't agree with nouns, we also mean that in a language like English, gender is a relevant criterion Pronouns do carry gender marking. Nouns are classified for gender. You do associate he with boy and she with girl. Nonetheless, in such a language, which is a weak agreement language, you don't find nouns being classified into various genders on an arbitrary basis, the way you do in a strong agreement language like French or Sanskrit. In those strong agreement languages, there is arbitrary gender attribution. Like in Sanskrit, you know that there are three words for wife. You get dara, a masculine word, and kalatra, a neuter word, in addition to patni, a feminine word. That she is a wife doesn't mean that the noun expressing her has to be feminine in an arbitrary gender language like Sanskrit. You can even get a neuter word or a masculine word. To this day, a language like German has Mädchen, a cognate of the English word maiden for young woman, which is in the neuter gender, das Mädchen, the neuter marking uh, maiden in German. English has no phenomena of that kind. You never have arbitrary gender assignments to English nouns. Why? Because English is a weak agreement language. The same is true in Esperanto, which is another weak agreement language. In Esperanto, the definite determiner does not agree with the noun. The verb does not agree with the subject. It is a weak agreement language. It simply chooses a different set of agreement sites from English. Exactly as in English, Esperanto has non-arbitrary, natural assignment of gender, so only males are associated with the masculine pronoun li, and only females are associated with the feminine pronoun she. Yes, we know that in English there are some metaphoric conventional uses of she with, for example, a nation, India and her neighbors. There is also this frozen habit that sailors have of referring to a ship as she. These are conventions that grow out of metaphor. One is metaphorically imagining a nation as a mother or a ship as a female. Metaphor is not the same thing as grammatical arbitrariness of the kind that you find in a language like German or Sanskrit or French, where the assignment of genders is extremely arbitrary. As in Hindi, you find the words for book vary between pustak, feminine, and granth, masculine. Kitab patterns with pustak and is feminine. This is unheard of in weak agreement languages like English and Esperanto. Now we turn to some phenomena in which classifiers take part and where there is a role for syntactic transfer. We consider the examples given from Bangla in 6. If you compare 6a and 6b, you find that in the a examples, duto chithi and tinte chithi, you've got the sequence 
numeral classifier letter, two classifier letter or three classifier letter. These are indefinite and they are non-specific. When you go to 6b, chithi duto and chithi tinte, these are the two letters. They are definite and specific. If you take only these examples, you cannot tease apart the definiteness effect of changing the constituent order and the, specific, the specificity effect of changing the constituent order. To tease apart those two strands of the effect that changing the constituent order has, you have to consider examples where the definiteness is supplied from elsewhere so that changing the order of constituents on the basis of the classifier only contributes specificity. So if you go to the examples at 7, if you compare 7A1, A, Luto, Chichi, these two classifier letter with 7B1, A, Chichi, Luto, this letter two classifier, you find that in terms of meaning, there is a change of specificity. The sequence, this two classifier letter where the numeral and classifier precede the noun is non-specific even though it is definite. Why is it definite? Because there is a demonstrative this which points. If there is pointing, there is definiteness. By pointing, the speaker expresses the fact that the speaker knows which letters are being talked about by keeping the phrase non-specific, the speaker is inviting the inference that the listener did not notice these letters before or did not know about them. When specificity is conveyed by shifting the numeral classifier context to the position on the left, I'm sorry, when specificity is conveyed by shifting the noun to the left and placing the numeral classifier complex on the right. The result is that not only is the speaker saying, I am familiar with the letters being talked about, the speaker is also saying, the listener, was pri the listener had prior familiarity with the letters being talked about. Specificity is very clear in indefinite examples like the very often cited example, John wants to marry a Swede, which is ambiguous between the non-specific reading, which says John wants a Swedish partner, and the specific reading that says there is a particular Swedish individual whom John wants to marry. In the case of definite examples, like the Bangla examples 7a and b, it is slightly trickier for you to grasp what is meant by specificity. That's why we are teasing apart what the speaker had prior knowledge of and what the listener had prior knowledge of. Specificity has to do with the presence or absence of prior knowledge on the part of the listener. A phrase is specific if the listener had prior knowledge. It is non-specific if the listener did not have prior knowledge. Definiteness has to do with the speaker's prior knowledge. Now that we have teased the part, the two strands of the contribution made by shifting the word order, it is time to look at the transformational mechanism involved. The simplest solution, no doubt, is to move the noun to the left. Notice that the noun is not moving all the way to the left edge of the phrase. It is moving to a position sandwiched between other material and the numeral classifier context. Thus, it appears to the right of the demonstrative, for example. If there are adjectives present, it appears to the right of the adjectives. Knowing this, it is surely easy to state a transformation, putting the material in the right place, and we invite you to do this. After you have done that exercise, handling the change of sequencing of the numeral classifier complex and the noun in order to express specificity. 
we take you to phenomena concerning what has been called anti-definiteness. Anti-definiteness is what shows up when you contrast Chodo Jon Chile, example 8C, with its anti-definite version, Jona Chodo Chile. Chodo Jon Chile has the literal structure Chodo 14 John human classifier Chile boy, 14 boys. And Jona Chodo Chile, which means roughly 14 boys, 14 odd boys, approximately 14 boys, has the shape Jona classifier Chodo numeral boy, Chile boy. In other words, when you have numeral classifier noun, which is the canonical order, you get an ordinary reading, which is unspecific and uh, whether it is definite or not depends on whether you have introduced a demonstrative. The anti-definite reading is coupled with the interpretation that you're not really sure about how many there are. You're vaguely hand-waving at some bunch of boys. Maybe there are 14, maybe a little less, maybe a little more. If you compare the ordinary default examples given in set 8 with the anti-definite counterparts given in set 9, you will find that not only is there a change of position between the classifier and the numeral. In addition, the shape of the classifier is slightly different. There is some alternation in the classifier morpheme shape, if you want to use the morpheme theory to describe this. You will also find that the e-text explains in detail why we have chosen relatively large numbers, numbers greater than 10 because it turns out that up to 10, this language has a special quirky effect in the anti-definiteness construction. It adds some quirky material to the numeral. And we don't want you to have to deal with these quirks in the context of teaching and learning materials where we are asking you to do exercises. So we've taken it out and we stick to large numbers and we invite you to carry out an exercise trying to state what is happening in the anti-definiteness construction. We remind you in the instructions of the exercise that since we have taken the trouble to stick to large numbers, you have to say that your transformation only works for large numbers. This doesn't require special gadgetry. There is no special feature or special arrow or dash or other piece of notation. We're just asking you to write in plain English after you have written the formal statement condition, the numeral has to be large. You have to explain what you mean by large. If you read the e-text, you will find these details. In the final section of this module, the e-text discusses a phenomenon very closely related to classifiers, but not quite identical. To see that the phenomenon is not identical, consider a language like Hindi. Hindi Urdu is not a classifier language. Nonetheless, it has what are called titular elements. One of the titular elements frequently used in Hindi Urdu is G. Thus, titulars and the titularization of a noun by attaching a word like G to a noun, Ramji, Shamji, Mantriji, are not restricted to classifier languages. Even Hindi Urdu, which is an honest to goodness agreement language, has titularization. However, you get to see the effects of titularization much more clearly when you view titular items in the context of a classifier language. That is why our discussion of the material in the e-text for module 31 confines itself to data from Bangla, which is an intermediate classifier language that also has titulars. Titulars can be used as independent words. A word like Babu, Mr., a word like Moshai, Excellency, or Dada, Elder Brother, or Didi, Elder Sister, can be used as independent words. But they can be attached to names or nouns to give you 
দত্ত বাবু মিস্টার দত্ত অর উকিল বাবু মিস্টার লয়ার রাজা মশাই হিজ এক্সেলেন্সি দ্য কিং মন্ত্রী মশাই দি অনারেবল মিনিস্টার বিরাম দাদা এল্ডার ব্রাদার বিরাম ওয়ে দাদা ইজ অফন শর্ট এড টু দা গিভিং ইউ বিরাম দা অর মিনতি দিদি এল্ডার সিস্টার মিনতি ওয়ে দিদি ইজ অফন শর্ট এন টু দি এটসেট্রা এটসেট্রা দের আর ফার্দার এক্সাম্পলস গিভেন ইন দি ই টেক্সট উই ক্যান শো দ্যাট টিচুলার এলিমেন্টস আর নট ক্লাসিফায়ার্স ইন দ্য টেকনিক্যাল সেন্স হাউ ক্যান উই শো দিস you see there is a plural marker in bangla the marker ra in the nominative which in the accusative and genitive gives you the portmanteau form der that plural marker can only be attached to a titular it cannot be attached to a classifier of course can it can be attached to an ordinary noun as well so from minister montri an ordinary noun you get montri ra ministers Now if you attach a titular element to a noun so if you go from montri minister to montri moshai the honorable minister that can be pluralized you can say montri moshai ra but if you have a classifier then it is impossible to attach the plural suffix ra so from chele boy you go to chele ta attaching the classifier ta remember that's the general classifier you cannot say chele ta ra boy classifier plural that is impossible so there's a clear diagnostic separating classifiers from titulars titulars can accept pluralization classifiers cannot there is some discussion of the exact features of the plural element in the e text that we are not repeating in this oral exposition because it would disturb the main line of the exposition and prevent you from following the thread lucidly we want you to now to concentrate on the kinds of meanings that the plural marking has in the context of titularization you see what a titular does when it is attached to a noun is turn an ordinary noun into an honorific name into a proper noun thus montri minister is an ordinary noun when you attach the titular element moshai to it the titularized word montri moshai the honorable minister a becomes an honorific word as the english gloss indicates and b becomes a name what is the effect of montri moshai behaving like a name one effect is that when a name takes a plural marking it is ambiguous between a true plural reading and an etc reading and these titularized nouns show that property we will first illustrate this fact about the plural marking from an ordinary name consider the name dilip if you say dilip ra attaching the plural marking ra This can either mean three people all of whom are called Dilip. The Dilips in this room please stand up. Ei ghore Dilip ra uthe darao. This is Bangla for the the Dilips in this room please stand up. Or the second reading the etc reading is Dilip and his gang, Dilip and his retinue, Dilip and his followers. Dilip ra ashpe, Dilip etc will come. you can't say in english the dilips will come if that is what you mean but in bangla you can say dilipra ashpe it is possible with any name now let us go to our minister example when you say montri moshai ra ashben remember it's honorific ashben because the honorable minister is honorific so the word for will come takes the honorific verbal ending Montri Moshai Ra Ashpen is ambiguous between four people will come all of whom are honorable ministers the true plural reading and this second etc reading some people have called it the associative reading this etc reading has the content the minister will come with his or her retinue i'm remembering to say his or her because many ministers of course are 
female, not male. So the point is, the minister and his or her retinue, is this second or etc. reading, this is available if you say Montri Moshai by titularizing the word Montri. If you stick to the bare noun Montri without titularizing it, the bare noun minister, when you attach the plural affix, does not give you this effect. When you say Montri Ra Ashben, minister plural marking will come. That unambiguously and clearly means the ministers will come. Several individuals will come and they're all ministers. Montrira cannot mean the minister and his or her retinue. To get that meaning, you have to titularize it and say Montri Moshaira. These special effects are clearly akin to the special semantic effects induced by classifiers in a classifier language. So it is no surprise that titularization effects are particularly salient in classifier languages as distinct from agreement languages. Much of the syntax of titular and classifier laden nouns remains to be worked out because most linguists speak agreement languages and have quite understandably done most of their research on agreement languages. Among the classical languages that have spawned grammatical traditions such as Arabic, Sanskrit, Latin and Greek as well as Chinese, Nearly all the languages are agreement languages. Chinese alone is a classifier language. It is small wonder then that the grammatical traditions of the world, and we know that the Indian tradition has been dominant among the ancient traditions, have concentrated all their efforts on agreement and on inflection, and that classifiers to some extent have been neglected. However, with the current socio-economic and cultural conditions of the present day world, it is to be expected that our understanding of classifiers, which has already made great advances, will make even more impressive advances in the very near future, which is one reason that we wish to draw the attention of all learners in this paper, Morphology and Syntax, to the importance of classifiers in the direction that grammatical research is bound to take in the coming years. We hope that you have been reading all the e-texts. If not, please do so now. We hope that you have been keeping up with the supplementary reading suggestions that have been given to you. If not, this is our last chance to ask you to do so because this is the last module of the paper. We thank you for your assiduity and attention. We hope you have enjoyed the course and will make good use of it and go far further than we can imagine. Thank you very much for your attention and bye.